Hello, welcome uh, everyone. Delighted that you could uh, join us uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Am Johal. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. I just wanted to begin by recognizing that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, we're so happy to be partnering for the 11th year in a row with the downtown east side Heart of the City Festival. Uh, they're a fantastic organization. There's hundreds of events happening all through uh, the neighborhood. It's wonderful to be uh, a part of it. It's also great to be welcoming uh, Leanne Simpson here. We consider her a friend of the office. It's the fourth time uh, she's been here uh, over the last uh, decade, and it's just a real um, honor. We've uh, spent today recording a podcast, doing a uh, graduate seminar uh, this afternoon. It's wonderful to have uh, this much uh, time with her. Uh, Leanne Bedasamake Simpson is a renowned Mishi Saki Nishnabig scholar, writer, artist, and musician. Uh, she's published extensively uh, creative work, uh, theoretical work, uh, has put out um, many, many albums, and uh, really delighted that you could be here. And please give a warm welcome to Leanne Simpson. Bojo Kinawaya, Gitagad Vizu, Nadenawema, Kinagachi, Nishnabek Ogumi, Nadonjaba, Nagoja Wanime Guadoda, Bidas Musake, Nadijanakas. It's so wonderful to be here visiting with all of you tonight. Thank you so much, Em, for having me back for the fourth time in a decade, apparently. Um, it's just wonderful to be here, and I, I appreciate you all coming out. This past year, I've been traveling around with Robin Maynard and our book, Rehearsals for Living, which is a series of letters that we wrote to each other during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic and during the Black Uprising in the summer of 2021. The letters were not two moms exchanging recipes although that might have sold more books. Um, they were meant to be thinking alongside each other and bringing into conversation abolition and Anishinaabe practices of world making. That practice of traveling and visiting with people and sharing ideas brought me into many discussions with black feminists, abolitionists, anarchists, small C communists, Palestinians, Sami people, indigenous peoples, and many other anti-colonial movements and struggles, dreaming and organizing their way out of racial capitalism, colonialism, and heteropatriarchy. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> Vancouver audiences. <laughs> the book was written when it felt like the world was falling apart, and this feeling only intensified for me as we traveled. This has only intensified for me these past weeks after watching the catastrophic situation unfold in Gaza. It's been three years of pandemics, freedom convoys, extinct glaciers, abortion and book bans, police killings, children alone in cages at borders, the resurgence of fascist states, open air prisons for entire peoples, and a dying planet showing us its pain through floods, wildfires, and unprecedented everything. What inoculated me from total despair was meeting so many rad organizers who were fighting back in inventive ways and who were engaged in struggle as a world-making process. In my earlier work, so Dancing on Our Turtles Back and As We Have Always Done, I argued for a turn away from the state and into indigenous thought and embodied practice as a way of taking back indigenous liberation from the state and the politics of recognition. So the Aboriginal rights discourse, the state's land claim and self-government processes, reconciliation, all of that to begin to make indigenous worlds that refuse the structures that reproduce colonialism. I think the idea was to sink into land-based practices, into language, into indigenous thought, 
to come together on the land, engaged in indigenous practice, to generate the knowledge that we needed to dream, vision, and build otherwise. My work was land-based. It was Michi Sagik in Ishnabek. And when I look back now, I see myself beginning to try and articulate Anishinaabe formations beyond the nation state. I see myself falling into complex practices or concepts within Anishinaabewin that transformed my thinking and that make the kind of hierarchy and violence required in colonial systems unthinkable. So for two decades, I'm off in the woods doing Anishinaabe things, and then finally I start to get it. I start to think a lot about world making because it is and was a constant and continual part of Anishinaabe life. It was a daily practice for individuals and families, and then it was scaled up into larger formations. It was always collaborative and temporary. It changed with the seasons and circumstances and as relationships transformed. Getting up every morning and organizing life with whatever you had and whomever was present was the fabric of Anishinaabe life and of generating new forms of communal knowledge. Every day, every moment, an opportunity to embody kindness, consent, self-determination, and generative collaboration. My ancestors saw their purpose in life was to live within the natural world, and they wanted to do that in a way that generated more life. They designed ethical practices to promote the diversity of life on the planet. They wanted to build interconnected and interdependent Anishinaabe worlds as ecologies of care and intimacy. Worlds that are living reciprocal collaborations with all forms of life, not just humans. Worlds that are networks cycling through time and space, expanding and contracting across scales. Worlds without hierarchy, prisons, police, schools, states, borders, property and enclosures. Open systems, leaky systems, decentralized, transformative, emergent. Political systems grounded in normative practices influenced and inspired by the physical cycles that reproduced the planet. Economic systems that refused the building blocks of capitalism. Societies based on individual and collective self-determination and extensive care for all forms of life. I start to understand that it isn't my place to make the world or to remake the world. My job is to fit into the complex network of life of which I'm a part and to do that in a way that I am bringing forth more life, not just human life, but all life. My job is to fit into the network of life and link up with other anti-colonial world builders doing the same. My job is to collaborate with all the forms of life I share time and space with, to build systems and world that feed into Mino Bamadzwin. I'm out in the bush one day with Doug Williams, the Curve Lake elder I worked with for several decades and who passed away 18 months ago. And Doug starts talking about eels. And I don't know what he's talking about because there are no eels in our territory. I know from my biology days, there are sea lampreys in the Great Lakes, but they're not even really eels. And this is definitely not what Doug is talking about. He is talking about a time where the American eel, who originates in the Sargasso Sea, migrated through the St. Lawrence River, through Lake Ontario, and into the lakes, rivers, and creeks in our territory. He is talking about an abundance of eels I can't comprehend, and how they were an important source of protein and medicine for our people. I start to map out that migratory route in my head. Stony Lake, Otanabe, Rice Lake, Trent River, Lake Ontario, the St. Lawrence River, the Atlantic Ocean, the Sargasso Sea. 
fresh water to salt water. Michisagik and Ishnabek to Mohawk to Mi'kmaq to Tayano to the Caribbean to the Middle Passage to the west coast of Africa to the northern part of South America to the world. Every year, the eel came into my homeland as a messenger and reminded us that our world making was deeply connected, not just to the species we shared our immediate time and space with, but with peoples and forms of life all over the world and on the land and in the water and in the sky. And not just remind us, but carry knowledge in their bodies about how their part of the world or the ocean was. If the eels were abundant and healthy, it told the people something about the health of their environment and the travel route. It told us something about ourselves as well. If the eels were scarce or thin or sick, then maybe we needed to ease off harvesting and rely on something else. Same with the birds and all the great migrators. Immersing myself within Anishinaabe thought was how I grounded myself in the now. And because of all of the dispossessions colonialism had subjected me to, I needed to spend time recovering that. The eels, though, reminded me that my responsibilities don't stop there. They aren't that insular. They reminded me to bring that into conversation with those who are engaged in different but related anti-colonial struggles in my neighborhood and beyond. The land has taught me that any meaningful Anishinaabe world making requires not only the radical transformation of the Anishinaabe out from under the domination of colonialism, but the radical transformation of the Canadian state and the planetary abolition of racial capitalism, its heteropatriarchal violences, and the structures that naturalize and reproduce the hierarchies it needs to replicate itself on Earth. What I learned from writing Dancing on Our Turtles Back, as we have always done, and Rehearsals for Living, was how important it is to think alongside and to listen to black feminist abolitionists and all the other peoples engaged in anti-colonial thought and organizing. It is how I can make sure my world making links up and feeds into their world making. I could have come to this same place by reading the Kambaki River Collective or by listening to migratory birds passing over my head twice a year. I could have learned this from water. The potential of indigenous world making holds this potential not just for our own communities and for each other, but for the entire planet. I have no idea what this looks like. I have no idea what my little Anishinaabe part could even look like. But I do know that I want to get up every morning and relearn the world, as Robin Maynard says, and organize every moment as an opportunity to embody kindness, consent, self-determination, and generative collaboration to destroy this death machine we're currently trapped in. And so this is where my new work, Theory of Water, which is coming out in the spring of 2025, fits in. I got interested in water because it passes through my skin and my cells. It's inside me and it's outside of me. And COVID-19 made us all very attentive to water droplets in our breath. Water changes from a solid to a gas to a liquid. The global water cycle is foundational to life on the planet. And of course, Anishinaabe people move through the land by traveling on water. And so tonight, I'm going to share three excerpts from this new work. Um, and then I'm going to invite my friend, or maybe Emma's inviting me, <laughs> up to have a, a conversation with you all. So this is the first excerpt. Jackson Creek is a creek down the street from where I live in Peterborough, Ontario. It flows into the man-made Little Lake and then into the Otonabee River and eventually into Lake Ontario. 
There is a five kilometer trail alongside the creek that I run on in spring, summer, and fall, and the parts of the winter I can't skate ski on it. Jackson Creek is by most accounts an unremarkable urban creek, I imagine much like every other urban creek in North America, and it's the body of water I spend the most time with every day. Peterborough is built on top of Jackson Creek, a fact that became evident to most residents in 2004 after more than 150 millimeters of rain fell in less than two hours and the creek burst over its bank and flooded downtown. These were the poetic consequences of constraining the creek to make room for urban development, forcing it into smaller and smaller underground tunnels, unable to carry the stormwater of 2004, instead furiously expelling it outwards without regard for homes, cars, or city infrastructure. Doug used to talk about the creek and its portage as part of a Mitisagi Kanishnabek route that collected Ngojuani, the place at the foot of the rapids, or Peterborough, with Shimon Lake. And every time I'm on that trail, I think of Doug and I think of that passageway. Today the creek is beginning to freeze after the first big snowstorm of the winter brought nearly 30 centimeters to us. I was up early today on the snowmobile doing passes along the trail compacting the heavy wet snow so that possibly tomorrow another driver could attach the groomer. I started helping to groom the trail a year ago during one of the pandemic winters. I volunteered at first just to keep my snowmobile skills up when I'm in the south so that when I return to work in the north I don't have to relearn how to drive the sled every time. Grooming certainly helped with that but those technical skills were eclipsed by something else. Nearly every day, the snow was slightly different along the trail at Jackson Creek. I became drawn to the process of sintering. When a snowflake falls from the sky and lands on the earth, it immediately begins, or perhaps continues, a transformation as it forms bonds at temperatures below zero, so this is not a melting process, but it forms bonds with its neighboring snowflakes or crystals to create the fabric of a snowpack. Sintering is a joining process, a transformative communal process that creates a fabric of former snowflakes bonded to each other. It is a process of changing from a singular angular snowflake to a more rounded form in formation of bonded crystals or a snowpack, a denser, more compact linked formation. As the snow sinters, it settles and becomes denser, stronger, saggier under the influence of gravity. Sintering is a slow deformation. Groomers pay attention to sintering because there is nothing like skating along a well-groomed trail of packed snow. It feels like I'm flying. As a groomer, there are a lot of factors that influence the sintering process. Temperature, humidity, time of day, weather, who is using the trail and how. I think of none of those things each morning I'm on the sled. I think only of the, the, this idea that the first thing a snowflake does when it falls to land from the sky world is to join bonds, actual physical bonds with its neighbor. It weaves itself into its environment in a way that doesn't destroy its neighbors. Sintering is bonding, building coalitions with your neighbors. Those coalitions mean that the packed sinter snow on the trail has staying power and it remains long after spring has melted the snow around it. Snowflakes in their own right are also fascinating to me. I understand from snow scientists that they start out as a single nucleated dust particle that attracts water droplets that in turn freeze and accelerate into crystal form. The temperature and humidity in the sky world mold it into a complex shape as it moves through the atmosphere. 
no two are the same. And when they act en masse and in commune, they form magnificent storms, upheavals, and blankets. So that's the first excerpt, and that's the trail. Excerpt number two. It starts with a quote by Dion Brand from Nomenclature. I do not have day, and I do not have moonlight. I do believe in time. I do believe in water. In 1991, Rebecca Belmore made a two-meter-wide wooden megaphone in response to the so-called Oka crisis, a Mohawk uprising to defend their sacred pines and a burial ground from becoming an 18-hole golf course. She wanted people to address the land directly, much like our ancestors had, and to experience political protest as poetic action. Over the next few years, Belmore traveled with the piece, setting it up on reserves, shorelines, sacred places, and sites of resistance. Along the way, she often slept beside it in her van. In Anishinaabe Moen, the piece was called Ayumi Ewach O Mama Moen, which translates into English as speaking to their mother. And as she traveled, the piece became an instrument invoking a sort of gathering space for indigenous people to amplify our voices and speak directly to the land. Our old people, Belmores in mine, had and have an intimate relationship with the land and water. They spoke to the sun in the morning and the moon at night as cherished relatives. They visited with the water lilies and Labrador tea before they picked them to make medicine. They prayed to the ones that passed on to the spirit world, and they prayed to the spiritual beings that lived in their worlds. They spoke with and dreamed of beavers and muskrats before they harvested them. They made offerings to whitefish before setting nets and to the lakes and rivers for safe passage. They were in constant dialogue with the world around them, which is saying something because Anishinaabe are not known as chatty people. <laughs> Many Anishinaabe still do this while harvesting, making medicines, or in ceremony. For many of us, the sound waves of our voices, vibrations made from the instrument of the body, are an affecting force in the universe. It is within this context that I understand a Yumiye watch o Mama Moen. At first, Belmore installed the piece on the land, outside of the gallery, outside of the confines of the so-called white box, and in the network of living things that contain the potentiality of indigenous peoples. In this way, the performance installation became a gathering site, a communal meaning-making project, and a space that generates knowledge. Ayumiye Wacho Mama Moen placed bodies with the relationality of land and water and asked us to relate through sound and listening. In a conversation with Anishinaabe curator Wanda Nanabush in 2014, Belmore says that her strategy of bringing a conceptual artwork in the form of a functional tool to the people and asking them to speak directly to the land itself as we have always done, strengthened her understanding of the role of the artist. The artist, the maker, the visionary has always been part of who we are. Looking back at the photographs and the videos from the first journeys of Ayumi Ewa Mama Wowen, I get a strong sense of how the piece brought people together. At Fort William First Nation, facing Lake Superior, and at the Wiggins Bay blockade in northern Saskatchewan, the piece is surrounded by friends, by family, by children and elders. There are fires and visiting. The sharing of food and stories and people took turns speaking through the megaphone. People were readily embracing the piece, speaking their hearts and minds, their bodies and voices becoming the piece and the multiple meanings it generated. Searching the internet, there is only a few recordings of what indigenous peoples said into the microphone. And looking back now, 
That is a lovely part. Possibly because Iyumi Ewa Chomamamoen was born in the 1990s where we didn't record everything all the time on our phones. The thousands of conversations were private in between the speakers, those gathered at the time and the universe, rehearsed, unrehearsed, in English, in Anishinaabe Moen, in song and prayer, the things that were said and the things that were unsaid, the demonic accounting of our lives. A collective accounting of a present moment. That the point of the piece was not just the content of the speeches or even the megaphone itself as a piece of conceptual art, but the meaning was made through the practice of speaking and listening, through traveling the land, bringing people together to engage in a practice of speaking and listening to non-human forms of life on reserves, in towns, in cities, and at the sites of indigenous land reclamation. When I think of that piece now, I think of the iconic photo of it on our sacred Nimki Waju under the care of Fort William Force Nation in Thunder Bay, Ontario. It was installed facing Lake Superior below where the Nimki or Thunderbirds nest. I imagine what it would have been like that day, the laughing, the joy, the sense of being present. I remember my own kids being frightened at their own voices as Ayumi Ewach Omama Moen amplified them into an already scary wa white box gallery of the National Gallery in Ottawa, reminding us all that day of how out of place Ayumi Ewach Omama Moen was in the gallery. I think of the birch bark moose cone collars our hunters use in the fall to call the moose. Um, the form of this piece enlarges that and the circumstances that led Balmora to be compelled to build a megaphone so that our ancestors and our relatives could hear our voices over the noise of capitalism, noise that has only become louder and more totalizing since the 1990s. While the relevance of a Yumi Ewach Omama Moen still resonates today, the work gave birth to siblings in 2017 in a series called Wave Sound. Visiting and inverting the concept of the megaphone, Belmore made four sculptures varying in shape and form to amplify the sound of water and the shoreline. The sculptures were installed in Banff, at Gross Morin in Newfoundland and in Anishinaabe territory at Puckasaw and Georgian Bay. Instead of inviting us to speak, though, Belmore was asking us to listen. Wave sound is an invitation to gather at the shore, to sit down, to use our bodies to hear wind, rock, sand, maybe mosquitoes and the durational rhythm of waves. I don't look at wave sound, although I could because it is aesthetically stunning. Instead, I become enmeshed in wave sound, placing my body on the land to quiet and to listen beside Nibi, to listen through Nibi, to listen with Nibi, a being that changes from liquid to solid to gas, that travels the sky world, underground, inside and outside of my body, an ancient formation of molecules that has been the same since the beginning of this world. A fugitive that erodes and escapes containment, one that we simply cannot live without. My ancestors spoke to their ancestors through the sound of rushing water, it's one of the many reasons that hydro dams, interpretive centers, and lift locks are so irritating to us because they close off channels of communication. The sound of rushing water is a sort of portal to another world. These waves of energy where human hearing gets altered were often places where spiritual beings lived or where certain events happened. Those sounds of water moving were also normalized. So the idea that Belmore would have to stop us, remind us, and amplify the sounds so that we could hear them 
I think would be startling to them. I quiet, I listen. Through these rehearsals, wave sound amplifies the voices of water to cut through the noise of colonialism. It works in concert with my great grandparents, praying and carrying water and with those yet to be born to become a practice. Together with my cochlea and auditory nerve, my mind and my heart, wave sound transforms from instrument to belonging as Nibby, Belmore, and all of the life she has gathered work alongside me to generate meaning and inspire new worlds. And so I take Belmore's invitation seriously. I'm asking myself, what does it mean to listen to water? What does it mean as brand asks us to believe in water? In November of 2021, in the midst of the fourth wave of COVID-19 in Canada, Dion Brandt's A Map to the Door of No Return was miraculously enacted as a ceremony, a gathering site, a traveling piece, a celebration, and of course, as a mapping and an unmapping by a brilliant formation of artists and writers thinking alongside and practicing waywardness. And this is the third excerpt. For me, the event co-created an autonomous zone bursting with mutual aid, stretching the boundaries of abolition and black feminisms, and celebrating the 20th anniversary of Brown's book with presence and engagements. There were readings, there were screenings, panel discussions, and exhibitions from all over the Caribbean, South Africa, and North America. These conversations from students, emerging scholars, and artists working in black studies, geography, dance, poetry, fiction, performance, visual and performing arts, marked the first retrospective of the book and its international influence, and it foregrounded a deep engagement with MAP's many readings of the world that slavery made from the 16th century to the end of the 20th century in Canada, South Africa, the US, and the Caribbean from the context of 20 years later. Firmly locating Canada in relation to the diaspora and the afterlife of slavery, MAP laid out a geography that reframes how we think about and remember slavery and freedom. That affects a change in what we, pr we presume to know and what we continue to disavow about freedom about the quotidian effects of white supremacy, about how we inhabit, theorize, and write about blackness, slavery, and colonialism, and their continuing effects, about revolution, longing, and black life. I had been invited to contribute a short reflection on the book, and I was grateful for that invitation and to think alongside Bran and her map to the door of no return. I was grateful for the gift of that struggle. I refound the book on the endless and chaotic bookshelves in our house, and I began reading. I read and reread the chapter entitled Pinery Road and Concession 11. I calculated temporally when Brand might have been living in my territory outside of Kinmount, Ontario, in a cabin in the woods. I thought about what I was doing in that same period. And then, instead of writing, I drove to Pinery Road in Concession 11, and I took as my companion a black ash basket, a basket that had found its way to me through a series of family and friends that I was returning to the cultural center at Curve Lake First Nation, which incidentally is on the way to Pinery Road. In the car, with map on the dashboard, I thought about place, belonging, diaspora, property, plantation, foreclosure. When I reached the corner where Brand's car had broken down in the winter, 20 years prior, 
I could feel the white gaze watching me from behind curtains and fences, on lawns and between chores. I could hear the warning barks of dogs. I could see intersecting worlds, dirt roads, farms, quad trails, prati stands amongst fragments of bush. My body filled with anxiety, rage, standoffishness, and humiliation. Taking all of this in, I got the idea of leaving a sort of surveillance camera at the corner over a 24-hour period to take time-lapsed photographs. I enlisted my partner, an artist and a maker, to make some sort of device with our collection of old iPhones, duct tape, and battery packs. We decided to time-lapse record the journey there and back in case the device failed, and I ended up liking the mapping of movement and travel. The device worked well enough, although not for the full 24 hours. It caught settlers moving around, attending Thanksgiving dinners, quadding through the bush, dogs, police, and the mundane goings on of whiteness. It caught a glimpse of what it feels like to be in Anishinaabe near the Burnt River outside of Kinmount, Ontario. A different situation and feeling than Brand describes, but one related by history and oppression and erasure nonetheless. So this is the piece um, that I voiced over the film of the um, time-lapse photography, and it's called Pinery Road and Concession 11. The sky is dressed in seven shades of gray, and I am dressed in seven shades of sky. The basket is in the back seat, loosely wrapped in an opaque plastic garbage bag waiting for its ride home. It's different than the other baskets I've seen in my life. It carries a darker color. It's also bigger with fancier detailing. I think it's made of black ash, bapagigan, that we can barely find around here nowadays. The old ones used to harvest a tree, canoe it back to the reserve, and then pound the log until the annual rings would separate into splints. The splints were woven together into baskets. I imagine the fancier ones were sold to white folks and the mediocre ones were kept around our tents and shacks and cabins to keep our belonging. This basket is a body made out of the years of Bapagigan's life. Each of those annual rings recorded growth and weather. Each one of those orbits, a document of light, heat, water, and nourishment. I think of who might have harvested the tree and paddled it back to the community. I think of who might have done the pounding to make the splints. I think of the woman who wove those years into something else. I think of the woman that paddled her canoe on Shimon going from cottage to cottage, selling and trading her hours for clothes and food for her family. We leave the city, driving through farmland speckled with conservative and people's party of Canada election signs. When we turn onto the reserve and cross the border, every telephone pole is wrapped in red cloth. I tell Bapa Gigan Makuk, this is because one of their young women was recently murdered by her white boyfriend, the one that loved catching frogs. We pass wooden cutouts of children dressed in pure love with the words, every child matters. I tell Bapa Gigang Makuk that we're allowed to be furious and sad now within reason. The one that ran away from school and into the bush, followed Jim Collins and Madden around. The one that didn't bring lunch to the bush, instead eating seagull and loon eggs and water snakes and frogs, porcupines and squirrels, muskrats and turtles. I wonder if Papa Gigan Makuk is looking out the window for their relatives. They will be hard to find. Much of the black ash was cleared by colonizers for farming and settlement, and the remaining are under the threat of the emerald ash borer, 
an invasive beetle who came to North America inside packaging in wooden crates. We stop at the old man's house beside the dump, but he isn't home. I use his outhouse and I'm overjoyed when I find the empty peanut butter jar with a half a roll of toilet paper inside. <laughs> Back on the road, we pass a lonely orange election sign as we pull into the cultural center. The curator meets us and through face masks, I retell the story of the 80 or so years Bapagigan Makuk traveled from an Anishinaabe woman in a canoe on the shoreline to a white lady's cottage on Shemong Lake, to a house in my birthplace, to my parents' house, and then my sister's house in Toronto, to my house in Peterborough, and finally here. In a quiet voice, he says, welcome home. We'll show the basket to Doug. We'll show the basket to the Elders Advisory Council. They might be able to tell who it belongs to by the signature in the style. Miigwech for bringing us home. I stop for cheap gas, a paper map, and bad coffee. There are no paper maps. It's September, the second September during the pandemic, and we've now been charged with the task of living with the virus. A code for the arithmetic that allows some of us to live without carrying the burden of those that succumb a calculation of who we will sacrifice to line the pockets of those with money. There is heavy grief in the air. There is a turn in the light as the first cool air marks the time of year when they stole the kids, where they still take the kids to remake them into people with pockets lined with money. Summer might have held space for running and laughing and shrieking around, but there is no space for that in the fall. There is no space for the sound of children. After I leave the reserve, instead of going back to the city, I head in the opposite direction, past Misqua Zibi, which used to be called Squaw River. In 1993, some of the elders at Curve Lake, led by Gladys Taylor, launched a complaint to the Ontario Geographics Name Board to have the name of Squaw River changed back to its original name. Misquazibi, meaning Red River. I think this will be the only time today I see my language. Next is Nogi's Creek. It is littered with ice cream stores and paddleboard rental shacks, campers and cottages. None of these people will know that Chief Nogi was a chief of Curve Lake from 1830 to 1848. He was exiled from the reserve to this place by the Indian agents and the missionaries. This was no real hardship for him. Nogi's Creek was a beautiful place where he and his family could live the good life away from the surveillance of Indian agents and God. I squint to see the good life. As I turn onto Burnt River Road, I inhabit a familiar sense of dread. Oh yeah. This is Michisagi Kanishinaabek land, and I'm grateful I'm in a car that is working well with doors that lock and a cell phone. I pass, re-elect Jamie Schmel conservative signs and elect Allison Davison PPC signs. I pass the sign for the Somerville track, land that was purchased by the County of Victoria in 1928. The land was cleared for agricultural use by the settlers, but then abandoned when it wasn't fertile enough. Red, white, and Scott pines were planted. The plantation is managed by the Ministry of Natural Resources. The trees are planted close together in rows, like corn. They are the wrong species for this place. They form a forest that doesn't have any parents or language because there is only one kind of tree, and they are all the exact same age. They were only children and they grew up as best they could. I sit in its width. Anishinaabe carried travel routes in their heads, passed down and in an east-west orientation rather than a north-south orientation, focused on creeks and streams and rivers and lakes and portages. These maps were stories upon stories of each time they had traveled the route if each time their parents and grandparents had traveled those same rivers and lakes, there were stories of 
storms and of hard times, of meetups and good luck, the bends and riffles, mnemonic devices for memories, the smells and sounds reminders, each journey another ring. To travel, one had to float, paddle themselves with rivers and lakes doing the carrying. Every destination was temporary, home always temporary, home always shared. Home, always a shared practice. Homelessness, always a shared practice. Aki mazi na igin. Aki meaning the earth, the land. Mazi na igin, a book, a letter, a document, a paper. A book, a letter, a document, a paper. When the colonizers came, they were always lost because they refused to live within the network of the living. They needed a book, a letter, a document, a compass, a paper, a policy, a law, an accounting so they could build fences and put up signs that say no trespassing and private property. I am getting close to why I came. Dread is filling my stomach with sharpness. My dread, of course, is not of the same register as Dion Brands when she writes, this place fills me with a sense of dread, but also a sense of mystery. Our histories and diasporas are different. What brought her to this place and now me, decades, decades later, are both different and entwined. My dread is commingled with shame. I should feel comfortable here. I should feel connected and like I belong. I should be stronger than my fear of these landowners. I should insert myself because I don't see myself. I should know the name of Burnt River in my language. I should want to live here in a cabin and write books and do ceremonies and tap maple trees. I should and I don't. Sometimes the land defeats you, just the sum of it. I'm old enough to know that coming here and retracing will not likely lead to finding whatever it is I'm looking for. I'm old enough to know that when I reach Pinery Road and Concession 11, there won't be much of anything. I'm old enough to know that I won't find a home, but we might all feel a little less alone. In this moment, we're witnessing the results of 75 years of settler colonial dispossession, 56 years of occupation, and 16 years of an open air prison of 2.2 million people in Gaza, half of which are children. It is heartbreaking and unsurprising to see settler colonial power line up behind enthusiastic genocide. I was in Palestine in May and my heart grew witnessing the strength of Palestinian families in the face of the quotidian violence of the Israeli par apartheid regime. This was taken outside of the Kalendia checkpoint going into East Jerusalem. And he gave me a free piece of watermelon. I'm interested in making worlds where life is precious, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore says where Palestinian life is cherished, where Jewish life is cherished, where indigenous and Kashmiri and Tibetan and Muslim and black life is cherished, where over Herero in Uyghur life is cherished, where queer life is cherished, and where we care for the planet that sustains all of us. I'm interested in building worlds where the violence of capitalism and heteropatriarchy and anti-Semitism, anti-blackness and colonialism are unthinkable. Lift the siege and the blockade and the occupation, dismantle apartheid, decolonize Palestine. And my friend Harsha asked me to remind you all to be out, all out for Palestine tomorrow at the rally, Saturday at 2 p.m., the Vancouver Art Gallery. Miigwech.
Wow. <laughs> that was amazing to um, listen to your words out loud. Um, could go in so many different ways. I, I, I texted myself this while you were speaking. I, I thinking about interdependence uh, between species and generations and more than human, the generosity of rivers and lakes, um, political entanglements, the time and the cadence of your writing, also about how to think around uh, political exhaustions, resurgence through the land. Um, I'm just wondering in, um, besides your creative work, you have your theoretical work and your music, how you um, keep all of these um, different investments, how do you keep it all together in terms of uh, being productive in all of these, these areas? I think that um, I think that it happens pretty naturally to me, and I think one of the reasons why I wanted to share this piece about centering um, with you in this way in this book is this is how it came about. I was sort of up early in the morning during the pandemic on the snowmobile in the park, grooming the trail for the cross country skiers, and then skiing it, um, not totally paying attention to what I was doing, but thinking about centering and thinking about what the snow was teaching me about how to live in community and how to create um, deep, caring, lasting bonds with the, the different forms of life that are around me. And so I think that um, I like to sort of take these ideas and build them into some sort of a practice, whether that is through writing or through music um, or through another land-based practice so that I can rehearse and repeat the process over and over and over again, because I find that that's where um, the kind of, that's that generative part of it comes through repetition and comes through um, me listening, I think, to the snow and, um, trying to really embody what it's, what it's teaching me. Um, it's wonderful to see you this afternoon with a number of, of grad students in a more informal setting as well. And one of the things you um, spoke about is sort of inheriting the, the struggle, the struggle inside the academy, political struggle, other places. And um, you recently recorded so, um, uh, Willie Dunn's uh, Pity the, the Country, but wondering if you can speak a little bit to um, that, that work and um, the, the, the influence of Willie Dunn on, on your own work. So Willie Dunn was a singer-songwriter in the, the late 1960s and, and through the 1970s. Um, Mega Ma, he was also an activist. He was involved in the Red Power Movement, so he used to come to Vancouver a lot. Um, he was a filmmaker, and he was part of the Indian film crew at the NFB. Um, and he made a one of the f well, what's known as the first music video in Canada. Um, and so, a few years ago, it was in 2018, I think I was um, part. My band was part of the Native North American gathering at the Center for the Arts in Ottawa, um, and we were playing with these elder musicians, so like Willie Thrasher and Linda Saddleback, Willie Mitchell, Elena Sobobswin was there actually and sang some of her, her pieces from Bush Lady. And I wanted to do a cover of, of a Willie Dunn song because his buddies were there and he had already passed on. And I Pity the Country was one that just resonated in my bones. I felt like I could stand up and say every one of the lines um, and have it ring true. And then that first night that we performed it, um, minutes before we went on, we um, had uh, the verdict in the Colton Bushy trial came down. And so the audience was very crushed in that moment that I stood up and sort of sang the song and said Willie's words into the room. And it was a, it was a really 
it was a moment I will never forget in terms of performance. And I was telling you earlier today that every time we've sort of performed that song, you hear that resonance. And so I worked with Lisa Jackson and Connor McNally, and we made a short film um, that was released at the end of September on Truth and Reconciliation Day that was made um, using archival footage from the NFB and from the CBC. Um, there's a, Willie starts the film playing the song to um, a group of young people at uh, Métis Friendship Center. And then there's this incredible body of work that really um, records a lot of indigenous resistance in Canada um, archivally that we've kind of, we cut through and then we end with his sort of I iconic CBC in the 60s interview where he's talking about the importance of direct action. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're here inside of a, a school for contemporary arts. There's a number of students here, graduate students and otherwise, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to how your creative process has changed either in your writing or your music, how you've evolved in the different ways that you've been producing work. Hmm. I think um, for music, I sort of started out doing poetry over music and I was interested in sort of that commingling of it. I think um, Theory of Ice wanted to kind of explore, sort of blur those boundaries between song and spoken word. So there's a lot more singing, there's a lot more song structure. I like music because writing is a very solitary process and music is very collaborative. You're also, um, I'm not with you and watching your face when you're reading my book. That's probably a good thing for you and me. Um, but when you're performing, you're interacting, you have a relationship with the audience, you see how the material is hitting or, or not hitting. So that was an interesting part of, of it. Traveling around and, and sort of doing the, the same songs over and over again was, was that kind of generative process again for me. Um, and so this time around, I'm working on a new album right now. Um, the music is now coming first and I'm writing lyrics and vocal lines to the music. So it's the, that process is sort of flipped. Great. Yeah. Great. I think we're going to open up uh, to everyone for, for questions. Just ask if you keep your question to about a minute. We'll take two questions in a row so we can get to as many as uh, possible. Also, uh, Leanne's books are for sale. We have uh, wonderful Massey Books. Our neighborhood bookstore uh, is here, and Leanne will be available to sign books as well. So we have about 15 minutes. So if you could just put your hand up and speak into the mic because we have people on live stream. Yeah. Go ahead and answer, I guess, there. Well, yeah, that's, I'm thinking about that last part with the, with the climate catastrophe, we're all about to be homeless. So I was initially thinking alongside Fred Moten with Rehearsals for Living, this idea that um, home is something that you always give away, that you're always inviting different forms of life into your, your home. Um, and I was, in, in this work, water is, is permeable, it's leaky, it's, um, it's kind of fugitive. And so I'm thinking about my homeland, not as like this territory that is my home, that I, is my personal property, but it's this place that I'm deeply connected to, that I have an intimate relationship with, that kind of expands outward um, in a way that I kind of am decreasing my relationship with it and it becomes someone else's. And I was thinking about all of the different forms of life I'm sharing time and space with. I was thinking about how my home is never just my home. Um, yeah, so that's sort of what I was, I was thinking of. Thank you. 
people in this room and for soldiers who have the honor of serving in this very important mission. I really appreciated that you talked about um, some of the issues that are raising the Palestinians um, as women and youth of this country right now, how we live in this world. Um, it reminded me of this exchange that we had with Chief Chief Al a few years, or first year when I was asked to become an intern with the Palestinian Association um, around the Middle East. I think I learned a lot from Alexis Pauline Gums in Undrowned. Yeah, like I feel like we should ask her because she's the, the brilliant one about this. I think it's a lot about spending time and presence and paying attention and listening instead of talking. Um, and so I think again, going back to everybody's gonna wanna be a groomer at the ski hill, but going back to this like very kind of mundane everyday practice that this was not like a, a methodology that I would have put in a PhD dissertation proposal, like my methodology is gonna be grooming the ski trail, right? But I, <laughs> But I think in the mundane, if we're present and mindful and listening, and that's very difficult to do when the, you know, it's been very, very difficult in the last few weeks, right? It's been very difficult when there's a lot of trauma, or it's difficult when we're struggling. But I think those kinds of moments of connection and belonging and regenerative sort of grounding are, um, are the beginnings of that deeper listening. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question is about the generation gap. Like, how do you bridge that for those elders and residents that are looking to the present and environment and the present moment compared to grandchildren, because grandchildren are bombarded with social media, uh, my generation is rather in Persia, the river, as you said. I come from Africa, so I see a bit also continental difference in my deeper look uh, on the world. And my, so, yeah, this is. I think you. it's that intergenerational interaction and interconnectedness is so important. So in my work in the north at the Chinta, we facilitate taking families out on the land where you've got grandparents and elders and kids, and eventually the phones run out of battery. <laughs> 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 and we're all left to our own devices. And the grandparents become very, very important because they know how to live without the phone. They know the things that you're supposed to do. They know the things that you do in the evening when you don't have power. They know the work of life. And in my experience, the younger generations, when they're in that situation, um, soak that up. They love it. There's so much joy seeing the, seeing the different um, generations interact. So I think that that's a really important part of education and building learning communities is having people of all ages trapped on an island with no electricity. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for three or four more questions. So. Wow, quiet audience. <laughs> yeah. I could have done this without a mic. Uh, is there any place that we can see your film? Yep, it's on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the YouTube. Um, it's on Instagram. But yeah, you should be able to find it if you Google my name and I pity the country. It'll pop up on, on YouTube. Any more questions? Okay, well, I, um, I'm going to thank Leanne in a moment, but I wanted to thank uh, everyone at SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, Kathy Fang, Sam Walters, Julia Ioki, all of the tech staff. Thank you so much for 
all of the work that went into that. And for those of you watching at home, uh, thank you all for being here. Leanne will be available to sign books, but thank you so much, Leanne, for joining us again, and I'm sure you'll be back. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. <laughs>